All right, why don't we get started? Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, my name is Dean Wampler. I work for AnyScale. And this is a talk about Ray, which is the open source project that AnyScale was started to develop. Ray was actually developed initially at the University of California, Berkeley. I'll explain uh, kind of why it was developed and uh, what we hope to accomplish with it. Uh, I, I do welcome uh, feedback at dean at, dean, uh, at anyscale.com, uh, on Twitter, Dean Wampler. And if you want to learn more about Ray or AnyScale, you can check out those links. Uh, we, we have some events of our own this summer, uh, webinar kind of events, and also I'm um, teaching tutorials on reinforcement learning and other topics that you can find out about at anyscale.com slash events. And we post information about past events at our blog site. Okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of explain why we need Ray by uh, discussing kind of the challenges of distributed computing, especially if they've been made extreme by machine learning and AI. Uh, so it's sort of the inspiration for Ray and how, how that problem set uh, led to the creation of Ray. I'll give you a sense of the Ray API and why I think it's such a good API in terms of being very easy to use, intuitive for people who need uh, to scale uh, mostly Python applications across a cluster for uh, you know, getting the, the benefits of distributed computing without having to know a whole lot about distributed computing theory and so forth. But mostly I'll also talk about the reinforcement learning library and other uh, AI libraries that are built on top of Ray. Those are the things you might use most if you're doing data science kind of work. You may not even deal with Ray itself, but uh, it's behind the scenes doing a lot of the work for you. And then I'll finish with a little bit about how you could start using Ray if you're interested. All right, so let's uh, sort of make the case for why Ray is a really useful tool for this problem. And I'm, just, I'm gonna pitch this in the sense of uh, basically deploying machine learning and AI as a microservice. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might build microservices. I don't wanna go into all of them. I just wanna focus on this last one, which is a common sort of really the DevOps part of the, the talk. Um, that often we need to deploy things separately uh, for a bunch, of, a bunch of different reasons. Like, for example, we might need to spin up different instances or different numbers of instances because of the load that they're carrying. Uh, let's suppose uh, microservice three here is a model serving library, and maybe it's evolving quickly, so we need to re, you know, uh, roll out new versions frequently while keeping the API the same. Let's say microservice one, doesn't change as often, but it needs a lot more instances because of the load it's carrying. I mean, these are sort of standard reasons why we have to do this. But it really kind of sucks that we have to manage these things uh, ourselves explicitly. Uh, we have to do that because we, you know, we run into the boundaries of single nodes, what they can hold. Um, so we need to you know, go across the cluster for distribution just to scale. But also we like to do this for resiliency. So if a node goes down, we don't lose work. Well, kind of the beauty of Ray, as we'll kind of examine a little bit more detail in a moment, is that it gives you the ability to think back on an abstraction of just having one instance, you know, your main application driver, if you will. And then behind the scenes, Ray can scale the work across a cluster to give you both the resiliency and the, the you know, quote unquote, infinite scalability that you might want. So it, it, it greatly simplifies the problem of managing microservices and kind of takes away even the name in a sense. Um, now, I don't want to oversell this. It doesn't solve all problems. You have to you know, be willing to accept, that the, say, the 80% solution that Ray provides in terms of how things are managed. If you need tighter control, then you might have to go to something that's a little bit more explicit about how things are managed. But for a lot of the problems that we've run into, especially in this world of data science, it's really quite sufficient for what most people need. And it works nicely with systems like Kubernetes, you know, whether you're running on bare metal or containers, pods, virtual machines, and, and a cloud provider, uh, all of those things, it just nests nicely because Ray is working at a fine-grained level of abstraction, you know, much finer than say the, the sort of pod level or, or uh, machine level abstractions. Okay, so, what I tried to do there is to give you a sense of how Ray takes away a lot of the pain of you know, day to day management of highly scalable, highly resilient services. So let's look at the API a little bit to get a sense of you know, why that's so. And I'm going to start actually by you know, giving you the motivation for Ray. 
and it really kind of answers two major trends. One is uh, from this uh, rather famous blog post from OpenAI that um, this, the compute required to train models has been growing like a factor of 35 every 18 months or so. Uh, you know, that's a log scale on the left. Um, you know, that roughly correlates to model size, for example. Whereas, um, you know, Moore's law and a sort of a corollary uh, idea called Dennard scaling, you get roughly 2x performance every 18 months or so. So obviously, you know, Moore's law, even with GPUs, isn't keeping up with com uh, the compute demands. So it's just making it more and more necessary to go distributed. The other big trend that kind of drives Ray is the fact that Python has seen enormous growth in the last you know, decade or so, largely driven by uh, data science and related workloads. But Python itself is not a terribly good language for distributed computing. Um, so, and most Python developers, especially in the data science space, don't really want to have to deal with distributed computing technology per se. So they really need something that's robust, but really easy to use to distribute Python applications. Now I'm gonna stick with Python for the rest. It turns out Ray is actually flexible enough for other languages. And we, we even have an early version of a Java API, but, um, you know, mostly we're targeting uh, Python developers right now. So if you kind of look at just a typical landscape of all the work people do in machine learning, and you know, this is just one way of representing that, a bunch of different tasks that we have to do, everything from you know, uh, featureizing, uh, ETL in our systems to stream processing is a corollary to that, hyperparameter tuning, training, simulation, et cetera. There's a whole lot of tools that have been developed for uh, these particular problems, some of which overlap, as you can see with the icons. But kind of the idea with Ray was, you know, there's a lot of commonality here in terms of distributed computing. Can we actually build something that could be the underpinnings of all of these things? So the, the sort of the, the view of Ray, the, the vision of Ray is that we have this framework that can underlie all of these things. And on top of it, you would have domain specific libraries for hyperparameter tuning, training, uh, reinforcement learning, model serving. These are the four that we have right now. And there's other third party projects that are using Ray like Spacey for natural language processing, this example. So just very quickly, what's it like to work with Ray? Again, if you're a data scientist, you might not actually use this very often because you'll be working at a higher level, but just to give you a sense of what it's doing for you, Imagine I have these two Python functions and it sort of fits the model of what we, we tried to do with Ray, which is let's take concepts people already understand like putting work in a function and figure out how to make that, you know, extend that to be distributed without a lot of uh, mental uh, load to be bared. So this is Python you already know. I'm just two fake functions, uh, one of which will, will construct a NumPy array and then another one which will add two arrays together. And if I add this decorator, this annotation, um, this adornment, I get you know, ray.remote, and that turns these functions into tasks, which means that Ray will be able to distribute these over a cluster or over all the CPU cores in a single machine, which isn't trivial uh, to do in Python by itself. Now for completeness, there's some import statements you have to add and you have to initialize Ray in your code so what actually happens is when you call these tasks, you actually use a remote function and that's gonna return an ID for a future. This is like a handle for the work that will be completed eventually and you'll be able to get the value that was computed from that handle. I can call it twice, I get two handles and then I could pass the two handles to add arrays. Now, there's a couple of magic things going on here. Um, well, first, the first thing I need to do is to call ray.get when I'm finally finished to get the value I want. But what I didn't have to do was carefully watch to see what was finished and then sequence the calls. Ray managed the dependencies between these tasks automatically. And the other thing it did is I didn't have to stop and grab the arrays from the first two calls and then stuff them into add arrays. Ray could do that for me. So it does a lot of work for you. It sort of looks like regular uh, synchronous programming the remote uh, method is, is good to know when you see that because it tells you that Ray is involved rather than trying to guess what's actually going on. But it otherwise feels like normal synchronous programming. Now, what this doesn't do so far is handle distributed state. It kind of assumes these are stateless uh, functions that I'm operating with. 
Once again, leverage a familiar idea, which is classes from Python. Here I have a very simple class called a counter. Every time I call increment, it's going to increment this counter. And so it's holding state for me. And this could be arbitrarily big, complicated state, but I think you get the idea. Familiar idea, wrap it in a class. And then once again, add this decorator ray.remote that turns it into an actor. Now the term actor is, is a historical term. I won't go into details about what it means, but you can just think of this as a distributed autonomous agent that can manage its state updates in a thread safe way and so forth. One other thing I had to add, I need a getter method. Actors don't let you just reach in and read the values. You have to use a, a method to get the values, excuse me. <clears throat> so call it the same way. We use the remote method um, and I kind of went too fast, but you can then call rate.get to get the values out. All right, so that's the core idea. What was going on behind the scenes was I was writing code that kind of looked like regular Python code, but it was actually being distributed over a cluster and the dependencies between tasks and, and actor method calls was being coordinated by Ray. So I don't have to worry about all that stuff. So let's talk a little bit about the libraries built on top of Ray. Uh, we saw this before where I showed there four lib libraries at the top. I'm only going to talk about one today, which is the reinforcement learning library. This was really the first thing that was built with Ray, because as we'll see, reinforcement learning kind of really drove the need for something like Ray. If you're not familiar with reinforcement learning, you know, here's a 30 second crash course. Uh, basically, you have some agent that's observing an environment. It, dis it takes actions or makes decisions in that environment and then observes what kind of rewards for some definition of reward it receives. And the goal is to train this agent to maximize its rewards over, long, over a long period of time. So it's a very different kind of uh, machine learning model. It got really popular uh, a few years ago, about five years ago, when it was used to uh, beat the world's best Go player to play Atari games and other things. Previously, it was kind of an obscure part of machine learning. And it's also been used for training autonomous vehicles and robotics <clears throat> uh, simulators like the thing at the bottom. And we're starting to see new uh, applications like um, uh, improving industrial processes. Um, I picked this example of uh, modern uh, assembly line. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat's scratchy today optimizing things like heating and cooling systems, power, uh, network topologies, uh, network uh, communications. There's some uh, well-known examples of using it to improve advertising uh, and recommendations like at uh, YouTube and Netflix. In fact, I think this, this diagram is from a Netflix paper, if I recall correctly. And as always, anything new, they try to uh, do better at finance, you know, uh, trading with, with such a thing. And trading is kind of a nice fit because it's also something that's going to, you know, proceed in kind of a time sequential way. And you'd like to be able to navigate through the, the, the world of the market, if you will, uh, in, a, in a good way. And I somehow turn this on. Okay. So the architecture of RLlib is basically trying to support all of these things in a very flexible way. Uh, this top level means that it integrates with some popular libraries like OpenAI Gym, which is a, a simulator uh, for various kind of uh, problem domains. <clears throat> um, you might have more than one agent interacting with the environment. And then you might be doing things like serving policy that's already been trained or actually training on log data because you can't run a simulator. Maybe you can't simulate your chemical factory very well but you have really good log data, you know, telemetry from past execution that you can train against. That sits on top of either custom algorithms you write uh, or, or uh, other people have written and contributed to Ray, as well as the ones we built in. A lot of the popular ones are already implemented for you. And then there's a point, <clears throat> boy, sorry about my throat today. <coughs> hmm. And there's a bunch of composable abstractions that we use to give you, you know, the reinforcement learning and all of that is then running on top of Ray to give you distributed execution over a cluster, mostly transparently. And there's some knobs you can tune, like I need GPUs for this and so forth, but a lot of it is just done automatically for you. 
You can actually use Ray inside SageMaker if you want on Amazon. And Azure has recently rolled out uh, support for uh, reinforcement learning using Ray and RLib. One of the interesting things about re reinforcement learning that kind of drove Ray in general was the fact that there's just a diverse range of compute and memory access patterns used. These simulators, these game engines, they look a lot more like regular apps and not very much like traditional you know, big data, a data flow, SQL query kind of problem. So they, they need special compute. We want all this to be efficient, right? Because we're going to be running a lot of these things to train this stuff in parallel over a cluster. You, know, you might be serving policy as well as training it. There, there are situations where you're training as you as you serve, you know, on the fly, online learning, so to speak. And then all these these different topologies between the the uh, the actors, the agents, the environment, and so forth. So all of that kind of diverse compute is what drove that very simple, low-level, concise API that I showed you earlier. But once you have something like that, then it's broadly applicable, not only for reinforcement learning, but for hyperparameter tuning, one of the other libraries that I mentioned, but we won't go into, uh, model serving, uh, training, and also microservices. So Ray was really born with this problem in mind. Be, be as flexible as needed for this diverse range of compute. But it's got to be efficient, right? So uh, Ray does perform very well against some other implementations of some of the standard algorithms like proximal policy optimization, uh, uh, DQ networks, and so forth. So finally, what if you want to adopt Ray? What are some things you might want to know? Well, it turns out if you're already writing code that uses uh, these popular libraries like joblib and multiprocessing.pool, you can just drop in Ray replacements, usually by just replacing import statements. And they pretty much work the same way, except now they, they break through the single node limitation and let you scale to a cluster. So that's kind of nice. We've also implemented Ray with the async IO. So if you like using that coroutine model, that works nicely too. In fact, it's an alternative to the API I showed you before. Uh, if you're more interested in Ray, check out Ray.io. Um, I'm developing tutorials, and I'm actually teaching a tutorial next week on um, reinforcement learning, if you're interested. And you can uh, find the, the Git repo at this link here, the Academy link. And uh, we, we like to you know, help people that need help. So the, the Ray Slack is a good place to go. And then there's a Ray Dev Google group. So to conclude, you know, Ray is this new state-of-the-art system for distributed computing. It's designed to minimize the effort it takes to go from like prototyping your Python application on a laptop to running in a distributed way on a cloud or uh, whatever topology you have. And it's designed for quite a range of diverse, complex compute tasks like you encounter in various uh, machine learning uh, problems. Okay, so I think I might have finished just a bit early, but I'm happy to take questions. We do have that uh, chat feature for you to ask questions. Uh, before I switch over to that, uh, once again, here are the links, uh, ray.io, anyscale.com. We are hiring if you're interested. You can reach out to me at dean at anyscale.com or on Twitter at Dean Wampler. And uh, do check out these uh, events we have this summer, like the training I mentioned for next week. And we post a lot of stuff in our blog as well. Okay, so let me uh, stop sharing my screen, and go back to the window, and I can answer some of these questions. All right. Okay, um, so oh, really good question. Someone asked, how does Ray compare to Dask? Uh, this is a pretty common question. Um, and here's the way I like to answer this. If you are doing distributed pandas or distributed NumPy arrays, you're very much oriented towards kind of what you might be using Spark for, for example, then Dask is a really good choice because it's really focused on that problem domain very well. If you need general distributed computation, we think Ray is much more flexible, much more robust, and much more performant. And so we're kind of focused more on enabling these you know, complex compute problems in you know, reinforcement learning and so forth. Um, so that's, that's the trade-off I would make. I would decide you know, which one which problem do you need solved first? And then pick the, the, the tool that fits best. And for things like pandas and so forth, uh, Dask is really good for that. 
Um, someone asked, can I use Ray in a non-ML application uh, simply as an actor-based application like Akka or Erlang? So I used to work for Lightband, very familiar with, with Akka. Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, I try to give you the, the sense of that a little bit with by showing you the API and also showing you this idea that it simplifies microservices. Um, we did, we, actually, our biggest user of Ray turns out to be a financial firm in um, China that mostly isn't using Ray for machine learning. They're using it for, for very, very large scale services like you know, fraud detection and session management and stuff like that. So it's very nice for that. The difference I think you'd find between Ray and say Erlang and uh, Akka is that I think Ray is easier to get started with. The API, there isn't much more than what I showed you. There are some ways you can dive in a little bit deeper but it really kind of goes with the model of being as simple as possible and then uh, making really good default choices about what to do behind the scenes with some ability to configure that. Whereas Erlang and Akka tend to uh, be more on the other side, more developer oriented towards, I'm gonna give you every possible thing you could want, give you all the power that you could possibly need, but you will have to step up a little bit more to uh, you'd be most effective using it. So, um, that's sort of my thinking about it. That's one of the things that attracted me about Ray actually coming from the Akka world is that I did find that it's, um, because it's really focused on people who don't want to think about distributed computing, who just need it and want it to be as easy to, to, uh, to get to as possible and are willing to live with a lot of default behaviors. I think it's, they did a really good job sort of aiming at that, that uh, user space. Um, Someone asked too, what about using sklearn random forest and pandas, for example? Um, yeah, actually, so it turns out the job lib support that I mentioned is really aimed at supporting sklearn. Um, there is, let's see, there's, uh, actually, I'll, I'll make the slides available. I, I, I think we're gonna uh, upload slides. I actually don't really know for sure for the conference, but you could always reach out to me, Dean, at anyscale.com uh, for the slides if you can't find them anywhere else. But they do have some links in there to blog posts. Or I'll tell you what, you could also just Google like the Ray blog um, and you'll find blog posts that talk about using um, uh, scikit-learn and, uh, and our replacement for Joblib and see how that fits your problem. Hopefully you'll find that it has the right flexibility for what you're trying to do. Uh, someone asked, what am I gonna cover in the tutorial? It is intended to be an intro tutorial next week. It's both covering how to use RLlib and what is uh, what is reinforcement learning. Um, so if you're not if you're already an expert, then you might find the first bits a little boring or maybe you know, a good review, whatever you decide. But um, I, I just welcome you to check it out and see if you like it. You can actually go to GitHub.com/AnyScale/Academy and find all this material. I will tell you that the reinforcement uh, learning material is kind of beta quality at the moment. There's some fine tuning that we're doing before next week. That's the purpose of next week's tutorial. Um, and I actually did a live tutorial a month ago on the core of Ray. If you go to the AnyScale blog, you can find the link to the video for that. And that code is also in the, the same repo. So AnyScale Academy on GitHub. Okay. Uh, what other questions? Ah, can Ray be married with GPU compute to accelerate computations? Yes, uh, I probably should have left this slide in. I took it out because I thought I'd run out of time. But uh, when you do this Ray.remote things, you can actually say this function needs two GPUs or whatever. Uh, you can actually specify resources there. And you can also do it globally. Like when you initialize Ray, I mentioned briefly that you call this Ray.init. You can actually say things like, uh, I need 300 CPU cores and I need you know 20 GPUs or whatever. So it does integrate nicely. Mostly what it's doing in these cases is leveraging the underlying, like when you're doing this with RLlib, for example, it's leveraging the, the uh, hooks inside PyTorch or TensorFlow or, or whatever to do that. But it but does understand these kind of resources. Is it available in GCP? Uh, interesting question because um, I don't think it's actually integrated with any of GPU services in the same way I mentioned for uh, Azure and um, and uh, SageMaker. We are working on making it 
much easier to just spin up rate clusters on GCP. There's some early work being done there. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we kind of tended to test most with AWS initially, but um, when you're spinning up stuff yourself, it's actually a very simple model for spinning up clusters. So it's pretty easy to do it. We're just trying to make sure that it's much easy, uh, even as easy as possible, let's say, and there's no gotchas when you do it on GCP. We're almost there. So how would companies use Ray in production? Say on AWS, on SageMaker, for example. Um, yeah, so you would basically, uh, if you ever did, well, I don't know, if you ever did Spark, where you just spun up your own uh, hand-rolled cluster, you basically start a head node with Ray. It's a very similar model, in other words. And then you spin up Ray on the other nodes, and it does a lot of the synchronization uh, and uh, sort of a federation itself behind the scenes once you do that. So there is a process of, of bootstrapping. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're also working on making that robust because it's a little. There's a little bit of single point of failure issues right now with uh, that head node, as you can imagine. But it is actually quite simple to start it up. It's not a heavyweight thing. It's not like starting up a Hadoop cluster per se. But uh, you basically start these processes that run as daemons on each node, and they talk to each other to manage distribution of work. Uh, there are a few other things running in the background you might notice. I'll just mention them so you're not confused. It is actually using Redis for some of the distributed object management. Um, and it, it does actually use the Plasma library from Pandas, if you see that kind of stuff floating around in your cluster. Uh, let's see. What about node scaling up and down on requirements? There is actually an autoscaler feature. Um, I'm actually just learning about it myself, so I don't know all of the capabilities yet. It's been uh developed with uh, some systems like kubernetes in mind and aws but it does actually uh, it is actually very um, agnostic about what you're doing so you should check that out and if you have any questions about it you can reach out to me and another place you can reach out to is academy at anyscale.com i respond to those emails as well but uh, let me know if you have any questions about the the autoscaler but that's what you want to look at in the documentation is the autoscaler um, how about comparing uh, uh, RLib versus Coach? I honestly don't know much about Coach, so I, I, I certainly not enough to, to uh, you know, badmouth it or anything. So I, and, but I'm not even to compare it in a good way. So I just don't know enough to, about it to provide a good comparison. Um, what the things I would look at though uh, to evaluate them are. In, in either case, you know, are, are the performance characteristics what you want? Are the APIs what you need? Is the ease of use what you like? Does it integrate well with whatever infrastructure or other APIs and stuff you want to use? Um, yeah, we, 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 we think it's pretty pretty good, but um, if you think otherwise, I'd love to hear that too. We, don't, we always want to know how we can make it better. What about, this is an interesting question, I think. What about IoT? Can uh, Ray run on a constrained on constrained devices? It's actually fairly lightweight. Uh, it's not as lightweight as it could be. Uh, someone asked about Akka earlier. Akka was really famous for keeping actor overhead down to like you know hundreds of bytes. You know, it was basically sharing resources to the point where any one actor really only needed a few hundred bytes and then some shared infrastructure. Ray is a little bit more coarse grained. It's um, like tens of megabytes per actor right now. And it, part of that is because it's also running um, like Python code. Uh, there's a C++ kernel in the middle and all this kind of stuff. So depending on how constrained the device is, you could certainly do it. I think what you would be care want to be careful about though is you wouldn't, I don't think you'd want to build a network topology where uh, you're relying on actors and the distributed devices communicating back to the mothership. I don't think, um, just to, you know, in full disclosure, I doubt we've tested that kind of flaky network scenario as well as we could have, and certainly like you know, a dynamic network topologies and stuff. Um, so I would be careful about doing that, like a distributed Ray topology. But if you needed, if you wanted to use Ray to like maximize the use of cores in an ARM processor, then that might actually work really well, especially if you're already planning to use Python. I'd love to hear about that story actually. So once again, if what works or doesn't work, you know, reach out to us. We'd, uh, we'd love to hear stories like that and see how we can help make it better if it's needed. Um, 
Besides large data workflows and managing the JPM, how does uh, Ray compare to PySpark? Yeah, really good question. What um, I think Py, uh, and Spark in general, its main strengths, and I used to use Spark a lot in, in previous lives. Um, what I love about it is it gives you really powerful composable abstractions for like sequences of data. And I'm here, I'm thinking more like, you know, streaming data or reading data at rest, but you want to process it in mass, do massive joins, group buys and stuff like that. And then actually use real SQL to do this in some cases. So for any of those kind of scenarios, Spark can't be beat. And I think, I think um, we don't have anything like that. We're, we've really focused on this problem of like distributed object graphs in the old object oriented sense because of the general compute requirements of things like machine learning. You can load big data sets in memory if you want, but it's not managed in sort of the automatic way, especially with partitioning the way that Spark does. So I actually think they're very complementary. Um, if you hate using the, or having to deploy the JVM, then that might push you more towards something like Ray or Dask even for Pandas. But, um, but otherwise, I think they actually complement each other a little bit more than contrast. I'm actually doing a talk at Spark Summit next week, and I'm showing how to embed some Ray code as a UDF and a Spark SQL job. To be honest, it's a bit of a hack, but it does kind of illustrate the, this sort of complementarity that's possible, which was my goal there. Anybody have any others? Um, I think TensorFlow integrates with Spark. Does that make sense with Ray? Yes, it does, actually. Um, uh, both RLlib and Tune uh, will use uh, uh, TensorFlow on, you know, as, you, as you want them to, uh, just with one slight, slight caveat. In RLlibs, there are a few algorithms that haven't been ported between PyTorch and TensorFlow and vice versa. But for the most part, we try to be um, Switzerland, if you will, neutral about using you know, really good systems like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Scikit-Learn, and so forth. So they do integrate very nicely. So just to, to kind of peel the onion just a little bit, like suppose you wanted to do a hyperparameter tuning of a neural network with TensorFlow, you basically declare, you know, use TensorFlow, use this algorithm for training, you know, blah, 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 and then and run. And Ray would kind of manage the coordination behind the scenes, but it would be using these big libraries to do all the heavy lifting. Anything else anybody has? I appreciate the good questions. These are great. Um, can I not use, uh, let's see, pandas data from inside the hit node? Okay, so question, uh, just to paraphrase the question, what about if I have pandas, a uh, big pandas data frame, uh, can I compute over the partitions? You actually could do this. Um, I haven't tried this myself, but here's what you ought to do. Look, there is one research project um, called Modin, M-O-D-I-N, it's a team at Berkeley that is actually integrating Ray with the Pandas API. And you might see what they're doing. I don't think it's quite ready for production, that system, but it does illustrate how you could integrate the two together to kind of do that to compute over partitions. But um, beyond that, I don't really know what details I, I would recommend for you. Anything else? How are we doing for time? Happy to, uh, oh, is Ray free? Yes, it is, it's all open source. Um, we are building some services that would make it easier to run Ray in cloud environments, but it's basically all open source stuff. You know, like most companies, we realize that that's the future. So it has to be open or no one will actually even try it to begin with. Are there limitations on the Python interface? Can you pass higher order functions to the methods? Um, Yes, you can actually. So what Ray does is it pickles all of the dependencies and stuff that's needed for that task uh, to send it off. So you can actually do this. To be honest, I don't know that I've actually done it myself just to verify that, but um, yeah, it should work. I've, I've, I've certainly seen examples doing this. Obviously to be safe, you probably wanna use something that doesn't pull close over a lot of state, but, you know, maybe it's, if it's a stateless little function, you know, like a, a sorting um, or, uh, you know, a comparator or something like that, then that would, that should work fine. Okay, probably running out of questions. Once again, I'd love to hear your feedback, dean at anyscale.com, and um, 
I'll uh, make the slides available to the uh, conference and you can also get them from me that way if you need to. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, thanks for tuning in again. And I hope you uh, enjoy using Ray. All right. Thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>